Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to a familiar Bible passage, if you like, John 3.16. John 3.16. If you know that Bible verse, you might not need to turn there. This coming Wednesday is going to be, if I've calculated correctly, Valentine's Day. That's a day that much of the world, some 30 countries, celebrate love. Primarily, they're celebrating the love between a man and a woman. That's the only kind of romantic love they ought to be celebrating, but that's the kind of love that will be celebrated. And that's actually the topic of what I want to preach on this morning. However, you won't be able to tell that by the Bible verse that I have selected. For the Bible verse that I've selected as a text verse doesn't deal with romantic love at all. It deals with God's love. Yet the two are extremely connected. Let's read it together. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself, preacher, you're going to preach on the love between a man and a woman. Why didn't you find a Bible passage to use as your text verse that deals with that type of a love? Well, in part because there's a problem. The problem is the Bible doesn't speak that much about the love of a man and a woman. It does speak some about it. It doesn't speak a lot about it. I've often wondered why not. The only conclusion that I can come to, and that doesn't necessarily make it right, but the only conclusion that I can come to is because God wants us to learn how to love our mates by first learning how to love our God and then by learning how to love others. As we learn how to love God first and then love others second, then we begin to learn how we can love our husbands and love our wives. So there's actually three kind of loves in the Bible that we need to do, two that we don't need to do. We don't need to love ourselves. I know that's modern pop psychology, but the Bible teaches us don't love yourself. And the Bible tells us don't love the world. So there's two things we're not to love but there's three things that we ought to love, and I believe they're in the right order. I believe we need to love God first, love others second, and by learning to love God and others, I believe we'll learn how to love our husbands and our wives. Now, of the three loves, loving God is by far the most important. If you don't learn how to love God, chances are you'll never learn how to trust God, and you'll probably never learn how to be saved. So loving God is the most important. Loving others is probably for most of us going to be the most challenging. Let's face it, there's a whole lot of folks out there that's just awfully hard to love. But loving your mate is going to be the most work. You say, preacher, why? Well, loving God's easy. After you've been born again, who can't love God? I mean, with all that God's given us, he's easy to love. Loving others to some extent is optional. By that, I don't mean God says you don't have to love others. I mean, we can pick and choose who we love. If, if, if you find somebody out there that's just too hard for you to love, you can skip over him and let somebody else with their particular gift sets love on that one. And you can go find somebody that you do love. So for us, loving God's easy. Loving others, we get to kind of pick and choose. But let's face it, loving your mate's not as easy as loving God. And it's not optional. So what that means is, if we're going to love our mates, we're going to have to invest some effort into it. This morning, if God will give me the chance, I'd like to share with you some of the ways that we can invest into the kind of love that God wants us to have for our mates. Four thoughts if I have time. Number one, the kind of God, love that God wants us to love with is divine. The kind of love that God wants us to love with is divine. Give you a Bible verse, the same author of that verse that I'm about to read is the author of our text. It's 1 John chapter 4, verse number 19. It says, we love him because he first loved us. I believe that verse has given us both a principle and a fact. The fact is we love God because God loved us first, but I think it's also given to us a principle. The thing we need to understand what that verse is saying. We love him because he first loved us. Sometimes we can better understand what a verse says by understanding what it doesn't say. That verse doesn't say lost people can't love. Lost people, unsaved people, unregenerated people, they can love. Uh, they may not be able to love like God loves. They may not be able to comprehend the love that God gives, 
but they can love. Uh, to be absolutely honest, in my heart, I struggle with that a little bit because I've actually seen some lost people that are better at loving their mates than some saved people are at loving their mates. And I think to myself, that's not right. I mean, I get that they can love, but they shouldn't be able to do it better than we can love. After all, if the love of God's inside of us, shouldn't it come out? Yet, while my heart tells me we ought to be better at this than they are, I honestly have seen many examples where they're better at it than some of us are. And I wonder why. Uh, again, the Bible doesn't give us the answer, so I can't know the answer, but I guess for the answer. I think maybe it's because some of that breath God breathed into him when he created man, maybe it's still in them. Now, you've probably heard the expression, man is totally depraved. I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. Man is not totally depraved. Man's depraved, but he's not totally depraved. If you ever meet a man that's totally depraved, you better run and go hide because there's no telling what that fellow would do to you. The truth of the matter is there's some good even in lost people. Some good. Some of them are hard workers. Some of them are honest. Sadly, some of them are more honest than saved folks. Some of them are more loving, more kind, more generous. The truth of the matter is we're not totally depraved. We are depraved. We're totally separated from God. What goodness lies in us apart from Jesus Christ could never earn us salvation, never merit us salvation, never cause us to find favor with God. But the truth of the matter is some lost people love better than saved people because maybe there's a little bit of the spark in them that God put in them when he first breathed life into Adam and Eve. <clears throat> then again, this verse that we're looking at, 1 John 4, 19, maybe, maybe that explains, like I said, I don't think that's just a statement of fact. It is a statement of fact, but I believe it's also a principle. He says, we love him, God. Why? Because God loved us. The principle is it's easier for somebody to love if they have been loved. Some people are just raised in a loving home even if they're not saved. And some people who get saved just weren't raised in a very loving home. If you weren't raised in a loving home, it's hard to know how to love. Whether you're lost or saved, it's hard to know how to love. But even if you were unsaved, if you were raised in a home where you were loved, it's a whole lot easier for you to mimic what you were given. I think maybe that's some reasons why unsaved people actually love their mates better than some saved people. But one thing I know, they can still love. So if this verse, 1 John 4, 19, is not saying lost people can't love, what is it indicating? What is it saying? And I want you to listen to me real careful because it's important. What it's saying, number one, is if you're not saved, you'll never comprehend just how woefully short your ability to love actually is. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you may think you've mastered the art of loving your wife or loving your husband or loving your kids, but you will never comprehend just how short your ability to love is until you've experienced the love of God. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, preacher, I know you, and I'm better at loving my wife than you are at loving your wife. Well, you might well be, but comparing how you love to how another sinner loves really doesn't do much to impress God. What we need to do is compare how we love to how God loves. And friend, you'll never understand just how short you are on loving your wife, loving your husband, loving your kids, until you've experienced the love of God himself. What does that verse say? It's indicating that we'll never comprehend just how much more we need to improve in this ability to love until we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. Uh, number two, it's also telling us that none of us in our present state are perfect at loving. Christian, I got bad news for you. We might as well face it. As long as we're in these bodies, there's some things we're never going to master. We're never going to master sinlessness. <laughs> I wish we could. I wish we'd get to the, to the hump where we crossed over and we never sinned against God ever again. But as long as we're in this tabernacle of clay, we're going to sin. We're never going to get to the place where we're faultless. 
You may be a good person, an honorable person, a hardworking person, but you're still going to have problems. Why? Because we still got a body of flesh that still comes up short. And you're never going to be perfect. You and I, as long as we're alive on this plane, we'll never be perfect at loving anybody. We'll never be perfect at forgiving people. We'll never be perfect at serving God. We'll never be perfect at being kind and gracious to others. Perfection is just beyond us right now. You say, well, preacher, is that, is, is that a reason? Is that an excuse for us to quit? No, that's a call for us to try even harder. We need to work harder to love our mates. We need to work harder to love our kids. We need to work harder to love those people that are part of our lives. Third thing that I get from that Bible passage, 1 John, is that love is a work in process. I don't know how you are, but I readily acknowledge, readily acknowledge that I've been a little bit slow at getting the hang of how to love people. Maybe you're that way. Maybe you're a little bit slow. Most of us, I think, probably have some scarred relationships in our past. Maybe you've, you've got some exes in your life. Maybe you've got some broken relationships with your parents or with your children or with your friends or with your... Most of us do. Why? Because love is a work in process. We're not perfect. We're still trying to get the hang of this thing of loving one another. So, well, preacher, I do have some scars and I do have some problems. What can I do to help fix those? You need to get this divine love that God gave to us. What is this divine love? This divine love is quite unique. You know what God does every time we do something wrong? Every time we fail, every time we hurt the heart of God, every single time we come up short and we come to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I messed up. You know what God does every single time? He throws out the old relationship. He completely forgets it. And every single time he starts a brand new relationship. It's as, it's as if you just got born again. He throws out all the past. You know what, what the problem is with many of us? We can't turn loose of the, of the problems, of the hurts, of the failures, of the offenses, of those that we're trying to love. And maybe, just maybe, they're having a hard time doing it too. You realize, since I've been in the ministry, the divorce rate inside the church as well as outside the church has been 50% or larger. 50% or larger. That means whether you're sitting in the pew as a religious person or you're outside in, in the secular world, more than half of the people have been married and divorced at least once. Now, I'm not throwing stones. I just want you to understand something. Do you know why people get divorced? Because it's easier to throw out the mate and start a new relationship than it is to throw out the memory of what was done wrong and start a new relationship. It's a whole lot easier just to get rid of the person and start over again, brand new, than it is to throw out the hurt and the anger and the bitterness. Now, it might be easier for you to do that, but that's not what God wants you to do. And I'm awful glad that's not what God did with us. Love is divine. And to stay married to one person for a lifetime is going to require some effort on your part. You're going to have to learn how to love like God loves. God's love is divine. Number one, what kind of work? Well, God's love is divine. Number two, we're going to love like God wants us to love. God's love is pure. God's love is pure. Now, most of what I'm going to say this morning, I'm going to direct to the older people. However, this is a thought I want to direct not just to the older people. It's what I want to direct to the younger people as well. Bible tells us that in our relationships with others, again, we learn how to love our mates by learning how to love others. In our relationships with others, one of the things that God's word teaches us is to keep our love Pure. Listen, 1 Peter 1.22, the latter part of the verse says this. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now that's not Peter talking to a husband. That's not Peter talking to a wife. That's Peter talking to the church. He says when it comes to how you treat each other, love one another 
purely and do so with a fervency. What does that mean? When, when you treat other people, when you have relationships with other people, you build those relationships for what you can give them, not what you can get in return. If you want to have friendships, if you want to be a part of other people's lives, it's about you giving. It's not about you getting. Peter's saying that's how you build strong personal relationships. Wait a minute. If that's true, when we're talking about dealing with strangers and friends and acquaintances, how much more is it true when we're talking about dealing with mates, potential mates, and those that we love? Our relationship ought to be pure. Now, just like there's a word for a pure relationship between a man and a woman, that word's called love. So there's a word for an impure relationship between a man and a woman, that word's called lust. Love is when we're concentrating on what we can give. Lust is when we're concentrating on what we can get. Love is about us. Lust is about me. Love is from God. Lust is of this flesh. Love gives. Lust is only concerned about getting truth of the matter is most people in this world, they're really more interested in a lust relationship than they are a love relationship. And the two aren't the same. Love, pure relationship. Lust, impure relationship. Sad truth. Not always true, but sad truth. Most of the time, a person who's interested in satisfying their lust is more interested in what they can get. And once they get what they can get, they'll discard you and go get it from somebody else. You say, preacher, that's a very negative view of life. Well, it's not just a negative view of life. It's a biblical view. Second Samuel chapter 13. Greatest king that's ever lived. David had many kids. Not all of them by the same woman, but he had many kids. He had one son by the name of Amnon. Amnon had a half-sister by the name of Tamar. David was the father of both, but different wives. Amnon, the Bible says, loved Tamar. Half-sister, but he had affections for her. And so the Bible tells us that he actually manipulated the situation, got her alone, and then he raped her. He raped his own half-sister. That's not the end of the story. The Bible says as soon as he had done this wicked act, immediately what he thought was love became hatred. And he took the same half-sister, threw her out of the chamber in which this indecent act had happened, bolted the door behind her, and left her wailing and crying out in the hall. You say, preacher, could that happen? It not only could happen, it has happened a million times. Maybe not as drastic, maybe not as suddenly, but it's happened a million times. Why? Because what Amnon felt was not love. What Amnon felt was lust. Love and lust are not the two, are not the same thing. They're two different things. Tell you two truths. Write them down in your heart. If you're young, if you haven't been married yet, or even if you have, write these down on your heart. Number one, if it's love you have, lust can wait. If it's love you have, lust can wait. If it's lust you have, love may never come. If it's lust you have, Love may never come. Now, that's not always true. Some, that's not a rule. Some relationships have started out wrong. They started out with lust. And yet over a period of time, perhaps love came in. It's not always true, but let me tell you, it's happened enough times that the highways of lust have been full of brokenhearted people. And usually, usually it's a brokenhearted woman. And usually she's left with a terrible mess that she'll have to live with for the rest of her life. Just understand something about God's love. The kind of love 
that God loves us with and the kind of love that God wants us to love with, it's pure. You say, preacher, in this day and age, that's antiquated theology. That's old thinking. Yes, it may be. But if you're going to love like God wants you to love, it's going to be hard work. Why? Because the love God wants us to have is first divine. And the love that God wants us to have is second, pure. Number three, hard work. Love is hard work. Hard work. Number three, love is commitment. The kind of love that God wants us to have is a committed love. Now that's not news. If you're a Christian and you have been saved for any length of time at all, you should know God is committed to you. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you've been born again, if you've been saved, you're still struggling with sin. You're still struggling with your flesh. You're still struggling with this earth. I got good news for you. God's committed to you. He's not going to throw you away. He's not going to discard you. He's not going to take away your salvation. He's not going to cast you into hell. Why? Because God's committed to you. Got good news for you if you're not saved. Even if you're here and you're not saved, as long as you've got breath in your body, God's still committed to you too. As long as you've got life, as long as you've got sense, the ability to reason, to think, if you will turn to God, God will save you. Why? Because God loves you. Amen. And God is committed to you. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's the great love chapter of the Bible. He, he, Paul, God, teaches us something about love. The old King James calls the, 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 the attribute of love, calls it charity. There's reasons for that. Won't go into that this morning, but there's reasons. But listen to what he says. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 7 says, Charity, or love, bears all things, believes all things, hopeth all things, endures all things. Verse 8, charity or love never fails. This is the kind of love that God has loved us with. If you're a Christian, this is the kind of love that God has loved you with. If you're lost, this is the kind of love that God wants to give to you. It's a love, the Bible says, never fails. The word fail means love never quits. It never gives up. God never gives up on the saved. And God won't give up on you who are lost until you have breathed your last breath. That's the kind of love that God loves us with. That's what we call a love of commitment. Now listen, the kind of love that God wants us to love with is the same kind of love. You say, preacher, that's some kind of commitment. Yeah, it takes work. It takes work to love somebody like God loves us. If you want to have the kind of love, if you want to give the kind of love that God has given to you, the kind of love that God has created us to be capable of giving, if you want to do that, you've got to be committed. Number one, you've got to be committed to one person. One person. God's a great God. God can love everybody at the same time. You can't. If you're a man, you're going to have to pick one woman and you're going to have to love her like no other woman on this planet. If you're a female, if you're a lady, you're going to have to pick one man and you're going to have to love that man like no other man on this planet. If you don't love your husband or your wife, if you don't love them so much that they feel the love, that they sense the love, that they know that they are loved. If you don't love them so much that they have no doubts that they're loved, you've not loved them like God has loved us. Why? Because that's how he loves us. I'm not saying I've mastered this. I'm not saying I've mastered it. Uh, listen, if I could only preach on what I've mastered, we'd have very short services because there's not going to be any time that I can preach on it. Uh, I, I'm saying this is a progress under work, okay? I'm still trying to learn too, but I'm telling you, if we could learn to love with the kind of love that God has given us, then there's a whole lot of no matter what options, no matter what qualities that we never have to mention. If we could love our mate 
so that they knew that they were loved. We'd never have to talk about forgiveness. We'd never have to talk about being with one person no matter what. We'd never have to bring up those no matter what issues, but the truth of the matter is we're sinners. We come up short. Even if we're saved, we still haven't mastered this. We're not going to master it. It's a work in pro progress. But if we simply could learn how to love with a love that God has loved us with, my friend, it would revolutionize the homes and the families throughout this church and all churches. It would change our existence. What is love? It's a commitment. It's you choosing someone and elevating that someone above all the other someones in the world. You doing for that someone what you would not do for any other someone. You devoting to that someone what you would not devote to any other. You might be kind to everybody else. You might be gracious to everybody. But that one, that one you put on the pedestal, you lift them above all others. Why? Because you're committed to that one. What is love? It's commitment. The kind of commitment that God has given to us is the kind of commitment that we're supposed to give to others. We're talking about romantic love, but we do this. We should do this with all others. We're talking about our children. Should I say this? My kids are better than your kids. Because they're my kids, all right? They're my kids. So I put them on a pedestal. They're, 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 they're my kids. My grandkids, sorry. Best kids in the world. That's it. That's it. Best. Why? Because they're my grandkids. You ought to put yours on the same pedestal. Why? Because we're committed to, we've chosen those, and they've been chosen for us. And love is hard work. It is hard work. Sometimes grandkids can be a little bit hard to love. Just like sometimes kids can be. Just like sometimes husbands can be. And just like sometimes wives can be. But they're ours. And we're committed to them. Love. Loving like God loves is a commitment. It's a commitment to that one. Number two. Talking about commitment. Love is a commitment <coughs> to love them no matter what. Now here's where the sweetness of the by and by meets the nastiest of the now and now. Truth of the matter is, if we could love one another like God loved us, if we could show our mates that they're the most special person in the entire galaxy, if we could make them feel secure, then we wouldn't have any of these no matter what's. But we're all sinners and we all come up short and we're all still learning and we haven't perfected anything yet. And so sometimes we have to say what shouldn't have to be said. But this commitment that we make to them is a commitment no matter what. Now I want you to listen to me because I'm going to get into some very controversial areas. And you may not agree with me, but I do believe, I do believe I've got the mind of God on this. Truth of the matter is, not everyone that we love is going to love us like they should. Not everyone that we've committed ourselves to is going to commit themselves back to us like they ought to have. Now, sometimes the fault's in them. Sometimes the fault's in us. We just pick the wrong person. Sometimes we are the wrong person. We are the wrong person. But the bottom line is bad situations do come to pass, even in marriages, which ought to be the most blessed state that a human being can live in. So listen to what I'm about to say. I do not believe that God would ever have any man or any woman stay in an abusive situation. I don't believe God wants you to be abused physically. I don't, want, I don't believe God wants you to be abused mentally. And I don't believe God wants you to be abused emotionally or sexually or any other way. I don't believe God wants anybody to stay in that kind of a situation. That's only half what I got to say. Neither do I believe that being in that kind of a situation means that we've got the right to give up on our commitment and move on. 
sometimes, sometimes we may have to separate physically. But we don't separate our commitment. We have committed ourselves to them for as long as we both shall live. We may not be able to live under the same roof together because it may be dangerous, but we'll never quit trying to love that individual back to Jesus Christ. If they're lost, we'll love them trying to get them saved. If they claim to be saved, we'll love them trying to get them right with God. We won't give up. Why? Because commitment is forever. Now, some of you, I know you've already gone past that. You've already gone past that. You've already got to the place where you've divorced and you've remarried. Listen to me. God can put that behind you like he can put anything else behind you. And the goal now becomes for you to make the most out of the relationship that you're in right now. I've had people ask me, should I divorce and go back to my friend? No, 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 no. That's that. Two wrongs don't make a right. No, no. But you've made a commitment now. And where you are now, you need to be committed to that one. The one that you've selected, you need to be committed. You don't need to live in a dangerous situation. You don't need to put yourself in a dangerous situation. You may have to love them from afar, but commitment lasts forever. Get this. And I know I'm a preacher. I can say things sometimes that are just hard to hear. But if you don't want Jesus to give up on you, why would you think it's all right to give up on anybody else? The truth of the matter is, the same God that's changing you is still able to change them. The same God that gave all for you is asking us to give all for them. And like I told somebody just this past week, God's brought you two together. Maybe it was his will to start with, maybe it's not, but now he's brought you two together. And you're the best chance of that person coming to know Jesus Christ that's in that person's entire life. That person now is your mission field. And it doesn't matter what relationship we're talking about. The truth of the matter is, if love is involved, loving like God loves, is hard work. It's divine. It's pure. It takes a commitment. Number four and last, and I will hasten. The kind of love that God wants us to love with is forgiving. It's forgiving. First Peter 4, 8. And above all things, having fervent charity, fervent love among yourselves. He's talking to the Christian body again, not husbands and wives. But he says, above all things, having a fervent love among yourselves. For charity, for love, covers the multitude of sins. What's he saying? He's talking to a body of believers just like ours. And he says, the most important thing this church can have within it is love, charity. Why? Because charity will help us to overlook a multitude of wrongs. I've been at this church for 38 years. In the 38 years that I've been here, this church has had numerous reasons to send me packing. I have not been a perfect pastor. I've not been a perfect husband. I've not been a perfect father. I've not been a perfect anything, and I'm still not. I've hurt people sometimes by accident, sometimes maybe with some malice in my heart because I'm a sinner like everyone else. But down through the years, this church has showed me great love and that has covered a multitude of errors. Folks, if that's how we're supposed to treat strangers and acquaintances and other believers in Jesus Christ, how much more so is it how we're to treat one another? We're to love to the place where we can bury a multitude of wrongs. I want you to listen to me real careful. The word that I'm talking about here is forgiveness. Now, if there's anything you know about the Bible, you ought to know that the Bible teaches us two things. We are to love and we are to forgive. If we're Christians, we are to love and we are to forgive. If that's true with strangers and other church members, it's true among husbands and wives. We are to love and we are to forgive. But listen to me, they're not the same thing. Love and forgiveness are not the same thing. God loves everybody. But God hasn't forgiven everybody. 
God loves every human being on this planet. But God has not forgiven every human being on this planet. Why? Because though they're similar, forgiveness is actually a special kind of love. Forgiveness is the love that you give when the relationship has been damaged. You can't give forgiveness if a wrong wasn't done. Forgiveness is love, but it's a unique, for, uh, a unique love. It's, it's the love that you give when the relationship has been damaged. Now listen, I'm going to say something. It's going to sound hard, but it's true, I think. God always wants us to love everyone. But we're not always able to forgive everyone right now. God always wants us to love everyone. But we're not always able to forgive everyone right now. We just had sanctity of Human Life Sunday, three, four weeks ago. That's where in our church, we pray for the unborn, that they would be allowed to be born. And for I don't know how many decades now, I'll usually make this statement because it's true. While I'm praying for our nation, I'll usually always say the same prayer, to, to these words in the, in the prayer. I'll usually repeat this. God, I can't really ask you to forgive us as long as we keep doing the wrong. I mean, you really can't ask God to forgive you of a sin you're still doing. It doesn't make any sense. Your wrong is offending the holy God. You're damaging the relationship. Why would you even think it's appropriate to ask for forgiveness while you're still damaging the relationship? No. When does God forgive? God always loves. But he forgives when we repent. When we surrender ourselves to God and try to take the offenses out of the world. Now, if we repent, he'll forgive us right there on the spot. He's always loved us, but he'll forgive us right there on the spot. And if we're weak, like we usually are, on down the road, we might do the same offense all over again. And you know what? If we're earnest and we're sincere and we come to God and we say, God, I'm sorry, I did it again. Would you forgive me? Guess what he'll do? He'll forgive you again. Why? Because as often as you're earnestly trying to repent and make that thing right, God will forgive you. I get this. This is the way God does forgiveness and salvation. This is the way God does forgiveness in the Christian life among Christians. And this is the way we're supposed to do forgiveness in the married life. Now, you may be the offender. You may be the offended. You may have done something wrong. Usually, it's both of us doing something wrong. But you may be the black sheep of the family. You, you may have been the one who has done the thing that is wrong. You're wondering why your mate's having a hard time dealing with it. Could it be you haven't quit doing the wrong thing yet? It doesn't make much sense for me to ask God, God, forgive me of pornography while I've got the computer screen on still the pornography, does it? I mean, if I want God to forgive me, I've got to take the offense out of my life. And if you want your husband or your wife to forgive you, you need to quit doing the thing that's putting the stone, the rock, the hurt into their heart. But if you're the one that's been offended, and that husband or that wife does come and say, listen, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I am wrong, and I, I'm trying, would you forgive me? And my friend, I don't care if it's the first time they've asked or the 40th time they've asked, you should forgive them. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to give them the keys to the house. It doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're going to say, go watch whatever you want to on it. No, you, you, you'd be wise. But forgiveness 
is part of love. You say, preacher, I don't know if I can do that. It's hard work. It's hard work to do it the first time. It's hard work to do it the second time. It's hard work to do it at the first year, at the 50th year. It's hard work to love someone. It's hard work. We're going to have thanks, excuse me, we're going to have a Valentine's Day on Wednesday. And most people are going to be celebrating the excitement of new life. Young couples, I've just fallen in love. Some are desperately trying to find somebody to fall in love with, so I have something to do on Wednesday night. But, but young couples, the excitement, I found somebody that's new, somebody that's fresh, and the infatuation is going to flood their heart. Man, I like those feelings. I still get them every once in a while. I like those kind of feelings. That's not the real love. It's going to make a marriage. The kind of love that's going to make a marriage is the love that's denied. It's the love that's pure. It's the love that's committed. It's the love that forgives. I'm telling you, that's the kind of love that is hard work. But that's the kind of love God wants us to love with. Please bow your heads. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the attention of the people. And Lord, marriage counseling is not my forte. But God... Preaching on the love of God, that is something I can do. Lord, I don't know where our people are. There's some people that are single. There's some people that are married. There's some people that have never married. There's some people that are divorced. God, there's some that have been married 50, 55 years. There's some that have been married just a few, few years. God, there's all varieties in here. But Lord, these truths are truth for everybody. Help us, God, as we approach this emotional time, this Valentine's time. Help us that we would want to have the kind of a marriage and give the kind of love that would be pleasing to you. And we'll give you the praise for what you do. For we ask it in Jesus' name.